Marconi's first ever year-round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Whiskey Neat, Spirited Conversations with Interesting People. I am your host, Christopher Hart. Listen, shout out to Stribe. We, um, they're not officially a sponsor, but they threw a discount code at us. So, check it out, S-T-R-Y-V-E, Strive. They're based out of, I think, Plano, North Texas. And, um, use the code PETE15, P-E-T-E, as in Whiskey Pete 15 and, uh, take 15% off. Raise your blood pressure. It's um, it's not jerky. It's actually a little softer, a little easier on the teeth. So, shout out to them. And, of course, <clears throat> Balconies and our new favorite Irish whiskey, Waterford. Today, on Whiskey Neat, we will be sitting down with the illustrious Mr. Fred Minnick, the ascot wearing uh, next Bourbon Hall of Famer, Fred Minnick. Uh, we will be sitting down with Mark Rainier very soon. Mark Rainier is the the mastermind behind the revival of Brook Laddie. Uh, he, Mark Rainier believes that some of the world's greatest barley is grown in Ireland. Mark's Waterford Distillery has created single farm origin Irish single malt whiskeys, expressions of precision and purity showcasing barley flavors derived from individual Irish farms and harvest. Individual Irish farms and individual harvests. Uh, it's pretty. It's a pretty neat idea. The concept of terroir is very hotly debated. I am a huge fan, uh, but I will tell you that if you're doing, if your distillation process is the same, but the the grain is the same from the same farm, different harvest runs, different, then then why does it taste different? Uh, it, it 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 has to be the terroir. So on the back of every box, we've gone into it in depth. Is a terroir code. Uh, where you can actually look up more information than they could possibly fit on the box, more information than they could possibly fit on the bottle, and it'll give you every bit of information you want, uh, or could ever, or didn't even know you wanted, for uh, whiskey. Their Irish whiskey, Waterford. So go to glassrev.com slash Waterford. It will tell you where to buy all three single farm origin USA exclusive expressions, as well as the brand new organic Gaia Edition 1.1, which is on its way to me. I know our Amroot barrels here. The guy is on its way. Uh, I should have a bottle of each soon. I'm very excited. So without further ado, uh, please welcome the the future Bourbon Hall of Fame author, uh, a, a incredible mastermind, dastardly trying to take over the, the bourbon world, Mr. Fred Menick. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks uh, so much for doing this. And the last time I saw you in person, we were recording over mm-hmm. at the, the, mm-hmm. the used to be privately owned Copper and Kings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, uh, you know, it's funny. They, they, it, anybody who like gets a, in a, in a, in a deal with Constellation uh, for like growth, they always seem to get bought out there shortly after. So, uh, you know, Copper and Kings is a is a near and dear distillery to to Louisville, Kentucky, and you know Joe Heron made the bold effort to to try and do American brandy in Bourbon Town. So that is uh, that was a grand experiment for amongst distilleries in Kentucky well, for sure. Uh, he 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 pulled it off. I think the the very first episode I did with him, I called it the uh, the Madman. Uh, I, I, I don't remember the exact title, but I just couldn't believe his his idea for a sales pitch on a business investment was to make brandy in Bourbon Town. So, uh, but he he seemed to be ahead of the game because it, it worked out just fine. Um, yeah, you know, it was. Uh, I think I think American brandy is is probably always going to be playing second fiddle to bourbon. You know, I mean, I every time the the industry tries to push something and it gets all kinds of attention. It just never surpasses it. Uh, and so like, I mean, bourbon is just so strong. Wh- whiskey is the, is the, 
is a liquid that can bring us all back together. You know, I know a lot of weird shit going on right now, but you know, if we can all just get in a room and just have one of these together, then by God, everything's just a little bit better. Yeah, I, I agree. So let's let's talk about this. So the Re- Repeal Day Expo. You you reached out to me uh, after I think it was a couple episodes back. Uh, you oh the the Matthew episode. You just said, mm-hmm. hey, would you be interested in coming on? And uh, I had no idea this was even a thing. But it's funny because anyone uh, I would say my age has probably spent some time behind a video game controller or played mm-hmm. online or played in some community where you did feel you developed friendships through video games. Uh, same thing on, on Facebook. We've developed these close. I, I watched the 50th round table the other day and you told them, you so I, you said you guys are my bestest friends. We don't, you know, hang out with in, in person all the time. You're my yeah. best online friends. And um, so you you gave me this idea of uh, developing kind of a second life simulation world expo. Talk to me about it. What's what's the idea? What's the what's the plan? What's well, the plan? so you can go check it out at Repeal Expo, RepealDayExpo dot com, and what it is is it's in this world called Deggy World. So think of like Sims or any of these like interactive video games where you're on a computer. And you're like in a virtual world as a different person. In this world, you have your own avatar. And you can you can ride a boat. You can go to a, a music stage. I booked uh, uh, some major musicians. Uh, Lindsay L., who's up for, you know, so many country awards every year. And she's got like a half a million Instagram followers. She's an amazing, talented artist. She was actually on my podcast. Once I got Sean James, who to me has one of the most beautiful blues oriented kind of voices it, right now. And he's incredible. Uh, Kelly Swindell, who's this rising star in country music. So I've got like a lot of really great musicians and you can go and watch musicians or you can, you know, you can take your avatar and you go into an expo hall where these brands you know, from Michter's to Kentucky Peerless to Jack Daniels uh, to t- 291 Colorado Whiskey. All of these like brands have actual booths where you can walk inside the booth with your avatar and watch the, you know, watch a video from them or have a conversation with them or click on a link or, or use your phone and go to a QR code to buy their product. So you can act, it's like, you know, obviously, you know, the effort is to get everybody to get the whiskey in people's hands before they come. So we have a retail partner that's going to be actively, um, you know, sending people bottles or or getting people to buy bottles or or people can go to their own store and buy bottles too, obviously. Uh, But the whole idea is that someone goes into the booth, has a conversation, steps out of the booth goes to the goes to a panel which by the way you're one of our headliners everybody Chris Hart yeah, is going to be doing a panel on Texas spirits um, and so you can go over there and watch Chris and his uh, in his panel and it's in an actual auditorium so it's in an auditorium where your avatar will sit down and voila you know and then you know from um, from your perspective, you're just, it's just like anything else. Like if, you know, like you're, you're producing it just like anything else. It would be like what we're doing right here is inside a world versus streaming on YouTube or Twitch or, or something like that. And all of this came from, all of this came from um, um, the fact that, you know, I've been doing all these virtual tastings. I love them. They're fantastic. They're all in Zoom or they're all in, you know, another platform, Google Meet or WebEx or, you know, whatever. They're And they're fun and they bring us together. But to me, there's just been something missing. And the, they're, when you have a Zoom call, outside of like a private chat, you can't do, you, you can't get away from, like you can't have a conversation with someone else. In this world... You can, uh, so if you're in the Jack Daniels skyscraper, you can walk to another table 
and have a private conversation with someone. It's just like you're there in person, but instead you have your avatar and you're going, you're going to these activities instead. And it's December 5th, which is repeal day. And with repeal is our celebration, you know, Everybody wants to talk about New Year's Eve. I mean, that's kind of like a like a mainstream. Everybody wants to do New Year's Eve. To me, Repeal Day should be a national holiday, and those who are spirits enthusiasts or beverage enthusiasts should really be celebrating this. And it's it's a reminder that our our rights can be taken away at any moment by government officials when it comes to what you drink. In fact, we're seeing it right now happen right now. And while this whole point is to have fun and everything, I will have a very serious uh, ongoing message that if you love bourbon, if you love your spirits, then you need to consider that when you vote. And uh, bourbon does not know a party. The craft in- craft spirits industry does not know a party, but they pay a, a boatload of taxes. And we're about to have a tax increase of 400% if the craft modernization act does not go through or get re you know uh uh reissued and we could lose a lot of people and so so the whole point of this is to have fun but it's also to have um you know have some awareness that you know this is an industry that's highly taxed and people really could uh you know pay you know focus on how to you know look in their how they vote based on uh, the spirits they love. Yeah, I'm looking at the you sent you sent ahead the graphic for it. I'm looking at it now. Uh, <clears throat> it's funny. Repeal Day, December fifth, is also the anniversary for Houston Bourbon Society, uh, and I I didn't realize they were on the same day until until right now. I'm looking at it, you got Black Blake Ryber is going to be there. Uh, Samara Davis is going to be there. Uh, you've got uh, Kenny Coleman. I notice his name is slightly above my name. It's fine. I understand. <laughs> Wait, isn't is it isn't his uh, name? So that those names are alphabetical. Oh, okay. And if they're not, yeah. So and if they're not alphabetical, outside of the musicians, they're alphabetical. Okay, that it makes sense. It makes sense. But and I'm giving him a hard time. I actually love Kenny. Uh, Kenny uh, Ryan too, the People's Champ. Um, the 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 event looks amazing, and uh, you can actually check out if you go to. Are you going to have the demo video playing on repealdayexpo.com or is it going to be- Yeah, when you go to the when you go to the uh website uh, repealdayexpo.com there's a there's a demo there and there's actually going to be an interview of me and my avatar uh coming out here pretty soon <laughs> where you can see my avatar giving you a tour. Uh the one the one um uh, the one unfortunate thing about this world, Chris is they don't have ascots, you know, so they weren't able to build an ascot. And this is this is <laughs> this is something I have lived with for a very long time. In that, you know, no one really, first of all, nobody understands why I wear an ascot. It, everybody wants to think it's like because uh, I, I'm trying to show a persona. It, it, I just really like them, and they're easy to tie, and I just I love them. I, it's really all it comes down to, and I always have, and. But when it comes to art designers and graphic designers and all that, nobody can ever draw an ascot right. Like it's like it's always it's it always seems like it could be uh, so easy, but it's something that no one's been able yeah, to down. It doesn't it doesn't work. I, it 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 just it hasn't worked. So I'm wearing a bolo tie, um, and kind of like an ode to my to my uh, youth. I wore a lot of bolo ties back in the day, and so I'm wearing a bolo tie in my avatar. So now the, you can you can dress up however you want to. You can dress with the with the outfits they have in there, and there's a lot of direction you can go. So like, and if you wanna, you know, if you wanna like, um, you know, wear high heels or whatever you wanna do, you can pull it off. Yeah, Jared Hempstead and uh, Robert Licorice over at Ironroot are gonna be coming down next week, and we're gonna film uh, our session then on Wednesday. Uh, oh, I was gonna ask, we could talk more about that later, but I, I, I was going to ask how to get that to you. But uh, I, I couldn't be more excited, man. The, the world, at first, I didn't quite get it. And then when I watched the tour, the video, I got kind of excited. I forgot how much fun 
Uh, once a year, I kind of, my wife, my family, we can kind of slip in one video game that I get sucked into mm -hmm. about once a year. So I, I couldn't be more excited. I think it's a, a fantastic idea. And as I said in the intro, I think you are constantly, uh, almost habitually at fault of being ahead of the curve. And this is such a neat idea. Uh, I've never, I, where did you come up with this? Um, I pr by the way, I appreciate that. I again, I don't think of myself like that. I just I'm always thinking, and I've got like, just even in this conversation, I've thought of like 15 different things that I'm supposed to do before I go to dinner. <laughs> but I can't, I, I can't, I can't turn that off. And ever, even when I was a kid, I had to do like 30 things at a time. If I had to focus on one thing, I think I would go insane. But this idea came from, uh, it actually came from my agent, my, my agent, uh, who is a, you know, he's a, an incredible, um, uh, music agent. Like he books, um, you know, he like represents like anthrax and, and rat. He represents a lot of like major rock bands and he has in the, with COVID like the music industry, everybody is they're just scraping and clawing and trying to figure out um what to what to do and this this company this deggy company they were the the middle bookers for for military um military shows and they saw covid happen early and they're like okay everybody let's pivot and create something that you know can you know, benefit the music industry. And they turned it into kind of like a convention world. And so it's a convention world that's essentially um, available for rent. And I'm essentially renting a convention space like I would like a, like a hotel uh, facility. And that's where it kind of came from. It's like it, all of this has come from, you know, ingenuity and the pivot, if you will, from from covid and like i'm i'm sur like i am surrounded like with music people so like i i work constantly with um the you know with managers and agents in the in the music world and um this is you know to see what musicians and and like the representation of musicians have done in covid I've I've learned a lot from that, um, and I've and I've kind of taken you know little pieces here and there and applied it. And by the way, Chris, this is my first show that is solely mine. E everything that I have done to this point in my career, I've been you know the the person who helped develop. But this is all my money. This is all my. Uh, this obviously all my ideas and everything, but this is, this is me. And, you know, if we could do it in person, it would obviously be very different, but this is the first time that I am putting on my own event. That is not just about like promoting a book of mine, uh, sure. or it's promoting, you know, you know, something, this is an actual, my first, you know, ticketed event, uh, that is not connected to to say, you know, Danny Wimmer presents or a magazine I'm with. So this is kind of me, you know, that's awesome. I mean, so you, you, and you're right. You've didn't, you've, you've dabbled in a little bit of everything. You recently announced your departure from bourbon plus magazine to focus mm -hmm. more on your channel. Uh, Fred Minnick channel. Let's can we talk about that for a minute. You've got to be the most active Facebook guy. And, and yeah, I'm looking, you've got Kelly Swindle, you've got uncle cracker. I'm looking at all these great names uh espn's trey wingo oh look at that uh you've are you putting all of your time into these two things the youtube channel and of course bourbon roundtables when they when they well they up? all well they all kind of like complement each other and and you know um i i do do a lot of things but what i'm always doing is is some kind of like bourbon connection or rum connection or spirits connection so I'm not going too far outside of of like really what is my, um, you know, type. Like I'm not, I'm Brand. not going back back into wine anytime soon. But 
you know where i'm putting where i'm putting my time is is a lot of like um is a lot of virtual things you know so i do a lot of like virtual events um you know that are kind of like private bookings and so forth sure and and so i put a lot of my time there but you know really you know i did i have put a lot of effort into youtube and i will tell you chris that youtube is is the most difficult um media you know to figure out yeah you could you could put something out that you think is amazing it's like well filmed everything and it has a great point and like nobody watches it <laughs> and then yeah, you put I, out I know the like, feeling and then you put out something that it's like a piece of crap shot with an iphone and you get ten thousand views on it like within two days it's 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 uh, you you I, i've got a better feel for for youtube but it's also like YouTube doesn't always reward knowledge and it doesn't always reward kind of like the middle line. I, I don't think the algorithm makes sense to anybody. I mean, we've Brandon uh, who's producing this episode off, off screen is the head of digital here at ESPN in Houston. Uh, we've had many a conversation over channel development because when I first started doing this and I talked to the bourbon junkies about this a couple weeks ago, right before the, the Matthew episode, I was posting the video, uploading it to Facebook because the bourbon world is on Facebook and then also uploading the video to YouTube. Well, I was cannibalizing my numbers, cannibalizing my audience, cannibalizing my ad revenue. I mean, there was no ad revenue on Facebook. So then we, we stopped and we moved everything over to YouTube and it has been uh, tremendously difficult just to get it, right? I mean, the Anthony Starr episode, Homelander, yeah. that the, this season was so incredible. You and I have talked about it. Uh, the boys season two was so good that, that it got picked up by the algorithm and we saw 160,000 views. Whereas Matthew McConaughey was on, uh, did everyone's podcast that that one's sitting at closer to 25,000 views. And I'm like, I would never think that I, I thought for sure Matthew was going to be a much more uh, highly consumed episode, but it, it's, it's hard to figure out. I've talked to uh, Daniel Whittington over at the Whiskey mm -hmm. Tribe, and I've talked to the Bourbon Junkies, and it's it's an interesting world of of what you get validated on and what gets completely dismissed. Well, I will tell you what what I, what I have learned and what has helped me in my career. And I mean, we're going on 15 years that I've been doing this, you know, some type of like whiskey media. And what I have learned is to stop trying to figure it out and just do it. Just do what you love. Like the, the Nike saying of just do it is, is the greatest there is. And there's also, and inevitably when you're in this space, you get criticism. And, and when you get criticism, a lot of people, their, their first reaction is to be defensive. I look at it as market data. You know, to me, someone is being, is publicly criticizing you because your brand means enough that, you know, they need, they feel the need to say something. So I, I don't, I look at those types of things as like, okay, that's a really good point. Oh, that's just a troll. Just, you know, kind of move on. Um, but you know what? I'll, I'll heed that next time. And, and so while I cannot figure it out, like my Mick Fleetwood episode was like, it, it was really stagnant for a long time. And then it just took off, you know? So, my my killer mike episode which to me was you know those are my Insane. two those are two yeah. of my favorite episodes um you know killer mike like took off and then it just like kind of like like trickled down in terms of the numbers my slipknot one i tell you what the, the, i i think that probably of everybody i've interviewed the most hardcore fans of all have been slipknot fans because those those people they're, I mean, they'll come back and watch the video like again or listen to it again, and then they'll bring it up in their forums. And I've had to like, I've had so many, so many times. This is how you know you're something you did is good. Is people in Romania steal it, or, <laughs> or it gets like bootlegged into like a DVD in China. It, that's how you know. But that's uh, you just got to keep plugging along, man. And uh, and the thing is, is that. Yeah. don't get discouraged about it. And, and if, and when you, and when you do just say, fuck off and do it again, you know? Yeah, and the thing yeah. is it, it, it's just, you gotta, you just gotta keep pushing. 
I, I'm but, curious. Uh, what, what, how do you, how do you know? I'm just trying to make sense of, of Slipknot fans um, being able to see. So how much do you pay attention to the analytics? I'm trying to figure out, do they just use their mom's login from, <laughs> I'm about to insult Slipknot fans. No. Uh, how how yeah, much? Be very analytic- careful about it. Uh, <laughs> be very careful about insulting the knot. I'll tell you yeah. that right now. <laughs> the knot, the knots. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm sure I'm, I'm just surprised they would pay attention to, to whiskey drinking uh, over, you know. The but remember, amount. Slipknot did come out with a whiskey. So I think that probably helps a little bit. But, um, you know, I, I'll say that, like, how I've been able to figure out that Slipknot fans um, are constantly absorbing the content is because it, one, it's getting stolen a lot, and, and and two is the comments. And that, to me, the greatest gauge of quality of content are the comments. Not a like, not a view, but it's a comment. I'm about I'm about quality, or at least it, it, in in a like kind of like an effort of not necessarily like the production. Like, oh my gosh, that's a great lens, and you look great there. Blah 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 blah. I'm not necessarily about that. I'm about providing something that can help someone make a decision or will help them uh, appreciate a, a band more or a sports personality more. I've done a f- I've talked to a few actors, but actors, I don't really interview a lot of actors. You get a lot of comedians and like, I, I, I don't think I've ever actually interviewed a comedian and well, that's, I, I think interviewing comedians is a skill. Because first of all, they're always punching back, and, and second of all, how do you not laugh all the time? I think sure, but but I'm you've always, got a real you got a skill for interviewing comedians, my friend. Well, I I appreciate it. I, I'm a fan of comedy, and I I always thought it would be an entertaining interview because we I mean, there's a thousand channels out there interviewing people, brains and distilleries. And, and a lot of the content gets a bit repetitive in nature. Like I never wanted to do, I never wanted to be the, these are your top five whiskeys guy because there are people out there doing it better than me, yourself included. There are people. Uh, well, I wouldn't say, I'm, I, I don't think I'm very good at the top five whiskey thing. You know, I'm, I'm not very good at the list, but I. The, I'm, but, I'm, but you know I'm what really I mean? Not, we we yeah. know historically. So, so my, I had a media guru, a marketing guy that, I still look up to as a Yoda in my world when I first started my whiskey festival uh, that, that told me that if you wanted to get into writing articles, the thing you should do is top five whiskeys to buy for Father's Day or top five whiskeys to buy this Christmas. And I, I always mm-hmm. thought, no, I, one, I'm not a good writer to begin with. And two, uh, there are people who have cemented themselves. And, and I mean, Fred, you are 100%. Anyone who knows how to answer the question I'm about to ask, the answer is always the same. The question is, who's responsible for making Henry McKenna impossible to find? The, the name that comes out of their mouth 100% of the time is you. And that's not to fluff you off. Fl- fl- blow smoke up your ass would be a better word. But it's, to, it's, a, it's the simple truth is that there are people who have been doing it long enough and doing it so well that I don't want to be just another guy. So I've always loved comedy and drunk comedians tend to be incredibly fun to talk to. I never knew it was going to be consumable. I always thought it would just be fun to be able to sit down with people from mad TV or Saturday night live. And uh, I've, I've loved it for myself, regardless of whether or not it was worth watching. One of my favorite interviews was Melissa Villasenor from Saturday night live. And that was before Mm -hmm. our channel kind of took off a little bit. I think on YouTube, it was a couple hundred views or something. I'm like, it, this is Melissa Villasenor. Like, I've been following her for the past 10 years. I'm a huge fan. Uh, and and it's, it's gotten – more stuff has picked up traction as, as time has gone on. But, uh, yeah, I just I, – I, I didn't I, – I didn't know how it developed into that. It just, it just kind of became that way. But I think that's how these things work is you find your lane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, my, my lane – my lane – but the Henry McKenna thing is kind of a sore spot for me because, you know, I, I went from 
actually being able to buy it and buying it regularly to being very open out there that it was my house bourbon uh, to not being able to find it. And then like, you know, like uh, <laughs> it is, it is, it is a, it, it also, I, I don't want to say it cost me friends, but you really know, it cost me, it, it cost me, it basically cost me the joy of uh, a lot of the bourbon forums and, and that, you know, and it's like when, when something like that happened, it, it kind of like, I, I sort of kind of became like a, a villain. I kind of, for, yeah, a lo- for, yeah, I became a little bit of a villain for those who, who like to get that. And obviously that's not anything I ever wanted. And it's not anything that I, uh, and certainly did on purpose, but, but at the same time, you know, do you want a critic to lie about what they, what they think is the best in that moment, just so you can buy it at the store later? I mean, I think that's the, to me, that is the, I mean, I, I, I'm an honest person. If something sucks, I'm going to say it sucks. I mean, just ask any number of the uh, $250 whiskeys that are on the shelves that, you know, that I said was crap. Or, you know, ask somebody who I referred to their uh, whiskey as smelling like a dead cat. You know, I, I just... You've been famously honest. And most recently, someone referred to you as the sponsor killer. In fact, that was you who referred to yourself as the sponsor killer. <laughs> It, that is true. Like, you know, as, um, as I do these kinds of things, there are inevitably, um, you know, people who want to, you know, c- you know, want to sponsor my events or they want to sponsor, you know, a, an ad in a magazine or something, you know, but I'm, I, I just don't care. I, I, to me, it's easier for me to go to put my head on my pillow at night and, and to be honest, and you know, quite frankly, this this like expo, uh, we had some vodka brands approach us, and we said, absolutely, you are welcome to come in and spend money and educate people, uh, but you will be in the vodka sucks hallway, and that is that is where it will be, and you have to you know because that's I've always believed that. And by the way, I am doing a panel on vodka for this <laughs> for the Repeal Day Expo. But, and I'll give you kind of like a hint, like my thing about vodka, you know, being like this, um, garbage, spirit. This, uh, yeah, it, it has, it has nothing to do with whether or not somebody likes it. If you like a brand, if you like it, please keep buying it. Drink what you like. Do not let my comments influence you. But my thing with vodka, it has a little bit to do with the historic fact that it came in the 1960s. It didn't even have a federal definition until 1958. And it comes into the shelves and it knocks bourbon off of the shelf. And it basically led to what became a 30 year decline of bourbon and companies went out of business. Families lost their heritage. There's any, a number of, of uh, distilleries that, closed a large and large part because of vodka's growth and then you add that to the fact that on the modern day sense vodka if you go into a major liquor store and you see vodka right there in front and center or wherever you go just know that there is a 95 percent chance that that vodka brand or that spirits company paid a large amount of money for that liquor store to oh, put paying. up that that shelving and there are any a number of um there are there are there are people who who there are distributors who forced you to buy certain brands of vodka just to get one bottle of a spirit and Boy, you were real that, careful with that wording there too. <laughs> uh, we were all- I mean, it's. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you an example. I know a retailer who, who had to buy some Blantons, and he had to buy uh, some Wheatley vodka, and he yeah. had to buy some Fireball to get to get the Blantons. And that's who now, I was thinking. That of is as well. 
that is not the only brand or company that does anything like this. Uh, I've heard of uh, I've heard of uh, any it, I've heard of distillers using uh, vodka brands to so like a distiller that has a full portfolio and Wheatley's included in it. I've heard them of using saying like, oh, you want uh, this uh, this particular beam or you want this for roses, which actually not for roses. You want those products? We well, got to buy. You got to buy some of this. X Y Z. Yeah, it's called inducement. Exactly. And uh, just so anyone's wondering, this isn't necessarily the supplier's fault. The the, the the it's not Buffalo Trace's fault or Sazerac's fault per se. Uh, a lot of this shenanigans happens in the middle tier, the distribution tier. And I know uh, for a fact firsthand uh, here in Houston, I know a few retailers who just to get a bottle of Thomas H Handy. Uh, 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 rye, they had to buy nine cases of Wheatley. And uh, I get it. I understand why uh, a lot of individual liquor stores will do package deals now. So even if they do get a barrel of Weller Full Proof, they'll make you buy a five bottle package just to get the bar the bottle of Weller Full Proof. You have to also buy three bottles of 1792. Uh, it's, it's, uh, everyone is trying to find ways to maximize uh, the demand. And I get it. Listen, we're, I know we're running out of time. I wanted to ask you quick. Well, as I want to, I want to kind of like, so like, so if, if we are to like finalize the comp, you know, my like mantra that vodka sucks, which is, you know, something I kind of created on a tweet, like <laughs> in a, probably in a, in a stupor. And, uh, it, this is why I resent vodka so much is the majority of vodka that you see and the majority of vodka that's marketed and pushed is not because a it is not a pull through effort from the consumer it is a push effort and and I do not it, it, it's it's it to me it is it's unethical um and if there is a if there is a vodka brand that you really love and you have to have it you need to get like that you crave it and there are vodkas with flavor. I know it has a definition with odorless and tasteless, but there are vodkas with flavor. They exist. And they're not there because that flavor is not there because of glycerin. But if you if you support vodka because of the flavor or you like a product, that is awesome. That is a completely different subject matter than uh, an entire industry using a uh, using kind of like a, a marketing scheme in in uh, in retailers and so that is where that comes from for me is that i don't like how vodka is basically a a bargaining chip for purchasing something that people really want and that's where that comes from well it's also uh a in large i would i think we can agree that in large the amount of craft vodka or, or in anything uh, any vodka is largely, mostly very one note. There are some with taste and smell, like you said, but in large, they are tasteless and odorless. And also, those those uh, those vodkas, even those nice little small uh, Polish distilleries or those Russian distilleries, there's, I mean, we could go on and on about this. There's actually a lot of tankers from the United States that go to Russia uh, and come back as uh, as Russian vodka when in fact they are Cargill okay. or MGP or ADM, you know, so there's just, there's just so much, so many shenanigans happening with vodka. And the fact is, is that it's super cheap to produce and it's, you know, they're going to keep doing it. But those small brands that you talked about, they're not getting that gargantuan shelf space. They're getting that one little bitty tiny spot in the back corner Um after you've passed all of these discounted special backdoor deals vodkas, that's when you'll see the craft vodka. So if you're a craft vodka producer, I support the shit out of you. I tell people if you want, if you like vodka, try to help a, a craft producer. You know, that's that's kind of my mantra. I know we have about two minutes left. I want to I want to get your uh, your top two surprised like this. This year's two releases that were just a pleasant surprise. You're happy with them. People should buy two two recommendations whiskey wise, and of course two that were that people should avoid altogether if you got time. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the number one that that was the biggest surprise for me was Rua, 
which is a North Carolina uh, single malt. I mean, it just blew my mind. I got it from sealbox.com. Uh, it just blew my mind and kept blowing my mind when I bought other bottles. Uh, it just really kind of like wowed me. Uh, the second one has been Fourgate. Uh, Fourgate, to me, this year, their various batches have been, they've been on point every single batch. And I know they're an arm and a leg. I think they're a $200 price point, but I really do like what they're doing. And I'm not necessarily a fan of like, uh, of the, the labels, how they do their labels with calling them like uh, uh, bourbons finished in XYZ cask. I'm not a fan of that, but it's, but their whiskey from a flavor perspective is absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, in terms of things that I sh you should avoid, hmm, I'm just kind of going through my your disappointment pile. Of, yeah, I mean, uh, there's there there's been there's been a lot of disappointment this year, but it is 2020. <laughs> yeah, in, in terms of this has not necessarily been the best whiskey year. There's been a lot really really stand out, but there's been some uh, that just did not up. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one. Uh, it was, I would say now there's going to be a lot of disagreements on this. Um, probably an enormous amount of disagreements on this, but while I loved just about every one of the Buffalo trace antique collections products, I thought, I, I, I thought that the, uh, the George T. Stag was my least favorite. And it was, to me, it's like this could have been a really good, really, really special year for the BTAC. But, and some people like the Stag. I mean, and that's great. But I just, to me, it was one that, you know, it doesn't hold up to the past years because that is, that is like, that is a, one of the hallmark whiskeys for me every year, is Stag. And another one to avoid that you don't necessarily want. Hmm. Uh, Old Forester 150th Anniversary Batch 3. Batches 1 and 2 are phenomenal. Uh, batch 3 was less than stellar yeah what's the price point on that i don't you know? remember yeah i don't, I don't either well listen I, I appreciate it so much i i i really cannot wait to uh see you on the fifth uh this yeah. goes live this friday so so you're announcing this tomorrow correct what it wait what is today what what day are we recording today's this wednesday, wednesday but this airs friday but i think you're announcing it on thursday yeah yeah we're announcing tomorrow and uh, just go to repeal expo, re, repeal expo day dot com. Repeal day expo dot com. Rep, what did I say? Repeal expo day. Repeal day expo. Repeal day expo dot com. Yeah, now I need to <laughs> double check it. Then let's see here. I mean, hell, it's my, it's mine. It, I mean, it's some promoter I am, right? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, it's it's uh it's opening now. Um, and then of course check out Fred Minnick on YouTube. Check out his channel. Uh, the guy's pumping out content like it's uh. Like like a work like a workhorse. I really can't believe how much uh, you're, you're you're doing. And yes, it's RepealDayExpo.com. That's correct. Tickets on sale now. Check it out. It is December fifth. Myself, Jared Hempstead, and of course Robert Ligrish will be discussing why Texas whiskey is on the rise. And uh, hey, Fred, thanks so much. I appreciate you coming on, and I'll get you out of here. Absolutely, man. Cheers. Cheers. Balcony's first ever year-round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more.